What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. Chris Godwin versus Kenny Galladay. These are two players being taken right next to each other in that late fourth round range. And it's been a decision that I've needed to make a lot because no matter how you begin your drafts, these two are extremely appealing options. This is usually the point in the draft where all the running backs you can feel good about are gone, so it's typically a nice spot to grab a tight end or a wide receiver. For making this video, I had them both right next to each other in my rankings, and they were both above ECR and ADP, but let's see how my rankings look after we do the breakdown. Also a reminder that I'm making another community video tomorrow, so be sure to write down which players you're avoiding the most in the comment section of this video. Okay, let's start things off like we always do with the stat of the day. Yesterday's stat was which receiver with a minimum of 15 red zone targets had the lowest catch rate in the red zone? Two answers were John Brown and Kenny Galladay. James Sosinski and Alex Greb each get a point. Today's stat, there were 41 wide receivers that gained at least 700 receiving yards last season. However, just two of them did so on less than 400 routes run. Name one. All right, let's start this breakdown with Kenny Galladay. And in his second season last year, he posted a 70 receptions, a little under 1,100 yards, and five touchdowns finishing as the wide receiver 21 in half PPR scoring. There are two concerns that people bring up when drafting Kenny Galladay. The first is Marvin Jones. With Marvin Jones in the lineup, Galladay averaged 2.7 fewer targets per game, and about 10 fewer receiving yards. When both of them shared the field in their first nine games, Marvin Jones was targeted 15 times deep down the field, and Galladay was targeted just eight times deep down the field. That number for Galladay shot up to 16 over his final six games without Marvin Jones. That was good for the third most in the entire NFL over that stretch, and that's a massive difference going from eight total deep targets for the first nine weeks to 16 over the final six. He also saw a higher target ceiling with two games of 15 targets in those final six games without Marvin Jones. Another thing is the red zone targets. We know that touchdowns are fairly random, especially for receivers, but players used more in the red zone expect to see more touchdowns. Over the first nine games, Marvin Jones had 11 red zone targets and Galladay had eight. Then, over those final six weeks without Jones, Galladay had another eight red zone targets. That might not seem like a lot, but Galladay had the same number of red zone targets in three fewer games without Marvin Jones. They also both finished with the exact same number of targets inside the 10 yard line, even though Marvin Jones played six fewer games. This all indicates that the team used Marvin Jones as the deep threat and the red zone option, and that Galladay benefited from him departing from the lineup due to injury to end the season. The second concern is the number of pass plays this season. Last season, Detroit was 13th in pass attempts per game, 18th in rushing attempts per game, and 25th in total points per game. This year, the Lions want to install a more run-heavy approach under new offensive coordinator, Daryl Bevel. We can't know exactly how many run plays they're going to have this season because that's also related to game script. If they fall behind a ton, they're gonna have more pass plays, but they want to, in neutral game scripts, run the ball more than they did last season. This is obviously a bad thing for Galladay. So those are the reasons that people might be off of Kenny Galladay, and honestly, they're legitimate reasons. You know, sometimes I bring up the reasons people are scared, um, but then I say, you know, these don't make a lot of sense or we shouldn't be overly concerned with that. But no, these make perfect sense. The return of Jones means fewer deep targets per attempt, fewer red zone targets per attempt, and there may be fewer attempts in total in the passing game. But there is good news. You know, he's six foot four, 220 pounds, boasts a 93rd percentile HUD adjusted speed score, an 85th percentile Spark X score. He has a massive catch radius, and he was an early breakout in college. He also finishes PFF 17th rated wide receiver, commanding the 15th most targets in the league, and just his second season as a pro. Because that's another thing. Last season was his second year in the league. You're telling me he can't develop into a better receiver, a better deep threat, a better red zone target in his third year? Well, of course he can. You know, we were all excited about a second year breakout, and it happened. What's to say he doesn't take another step forward in his third year and produce a third year breakout into the elite tier of wide receivers? That can happen. He has the talent to do so. All right, let's move on to Chris 
Godwin. And Godwin is also entering his third season as a pro. The difference between the two is that Godwin is two years younger. He's just 23 years old, making him one of the youngest possible third-year wide receivers. He's proven to be an extremely efficient wide receiver over his first two seasons, even finishing as the wide receiver 25 last year on just 95 targets. In fact, despite appearing in every single game, he was on the field for less than 65% of the team's snaps. The only reason Godwin hasn't truly broken out yet has been opportunity. He has the athleticism, 90th percentile head adjusted speed score, 96th percentile spark X score, a large catch radius, and a very early breakout age. He's also been productive when given the chance. Godwin has just eight career games with seven or more targets. His season long pace in those games, 78 receptions for over 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns. And that would be on 148 targets, which you might think is a bit high, but it's possible this season. The Bucks lost Adam Humphreys to free agency, and then they traded away Deshaun Jackson. Well, that frees up 179 targets in the offense. Realistically, only 15 to 20 of those could go to Mike Evans since he already had a ton last season. Some of them will go to Howard and Brayton Perriman, but a lot of them are going to go to Chris Godwin. He's now the clear-cut slot option on this team, and that's a role that just produced a 76 reception for 816 yards and five touchdown season to Adam Humphreys. You know, if the community can agree on one thing, it's that Chris Godwin is is better than Adam Humphreys. This new full-time role is going to produce an even higher catch rate and more total targets. There's also the touchdowns. Deshaun Jackson and Adam Humphreys leave behind nine receiving touchdowns. Well, that's huge for Chris Godwin as he already led the team with 16 targets inside the 20-yard line and led the team by a mile with 11 targets inside the 10. That last stat was tied for the fourth most in the NFL. And remember, this is while playing in less than 65% of games. He had the 7th highest team market share inside the 10-yard line, and his snaps and target share are going to increase by a lot this season. So what's the negative with Godwin? You know, you say all these positive things. Well, honestly, I can't think of one. He hasn't missed a game in his career, and he showed up on an injury report just one time for one week. He wasn't lucky in any area last season, so he's not set to see any negative regression. And his target and snap share can only go up with how many of them are left over from last season. He's on a team that still has a bad offense, still has a mediocre ground game, and has a new head coach, Bruce Arians, that loves to be aggressive and push the ball downfield in the passing game. I have Godwin projected for 87 receptions this season, but he could realistically see over 100. You know, Arians was the head coach in Arizona from 2013 to 2017, and during that stretch, Larry Fitzgerald produced three consecutive 105-plus reception seasons in the exact same role that Godwin is set to play this season. So who would I draft? You know, I love both of these guys. They were, along with Tyler Lockett, our favorite late round wide receivers last season. And I think that they will both have great years. But if I need to decide between the two of them, then I'm drafting Chris Godwin. They finished relatively close to each other last season, but Galladay is set to see more competition for targets because Jones is coming back on an offense that should run fewer total pass plays. While Godwin is set to see an uptick in total targets, these targets should be more efficient coming from the slot on an offense that will remain amongst the league leaders in pass attempts. I feel much more confident that Chris Godwin will have a more consistent season this year, and he has just as much, if not more, upside. He has a real shot to get over 100 receptions which means he's being undervalued at his current ADP. Right now, he's my wide receiver 17, which is three spots above ECR and four spots above ADP. And remember, you can see my full rankings, my projections, and my player notes at our website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. But that's the end of this breakdown. I hope you all did enjoy. If you did, how about hitting that like button? If you're new here, how about subscribing to the channel? But that's the end of this one. And thanks for watching.